Welcome everybody. My name is Liz Rich and I am the Acting Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at the Feliciano Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Montclair State University. And welcome to week two of our weekly Women Entrepreneurship Series. This week we are really excited to be talking about innovation in fashion and retail. And for those of you who are getting our updates, um, you, you saw earlier this week, we spoke with Latoya Sturup of Cosmology and Pauline Nakios of Lilla P. But today we want to focus on today. We are so thrilled and excited to be speaking with Montclair State University alum, Tiffany Aliche, who is the founder of The Budget Nista, a company based nearby in Newark. So welcome, Tiffany. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for having me, Liz. I'm excited too. Yay. So we're just going to get started here. And Right off the bat, can you tell us what is the Budget Nista? So the Budget Nista is a financial services firm. We help women live richer lives. Like how do you use your money to enhance your life? So we do that. I have an online school called the Live Richer Academy. I've got several books. I, um, I speak, I teach, I have free courses online. So before I started the Budget Nista, I was a school teacher. So it's just, it's an educational firm where we just teach you like, what do you do with your money and how do you use it to make your life better? How do you use it to make your life richer? Awesome. So, um, and we'll get more, I wanna get more into the, all of your different brand extensions in a minute, but first I would love to hear, you know, at Montclair State, we talk a lot about, um, you know, a lot of good ideas and a lot of good businesses come from this idea that you're identifying a problem in the marketplace yes. that you're trying to solve for. So tell us, what problem are you trying to solve for with Budget Nista? So the problem I'm trying to solve for really, it's, it's three parts. So as an educator, I know that the best way to move you from where you are to where you want to be are three components, knowledge, access, and community. And so the Budget Nista is trying to solve for, well, there are so many, especially women, who have been left out of the financial conversation, whether it's through benign neglect or intentionally. And how do we re like um, how do we remedy that? You know, and it's through knowledge, access, and community. So the budget needs to is like, okay, how can I get you to these courses and books and classes and, and things like I'm doing now, right? But then too, how can I provide access to different resources? And the, the best way to provide access is through other people. So I do a lot of partnering with other um, um, subject matter experts, taxes, investing, real estate, you know? And so access through other people. I like, if you know me, I'm like the partnership queen and then community. So I've got over a million women worldwide. We call ourselves dream catchers. So that's, I always say the dream catchers are the beehive of, of personal finance. So Beyonce has a beehive, but Janice has dream catchers, right? So, but we congregate online largely in our Facebook group. And um, that's the community aspect because you need accountability, accountability. You need normalization of the, of the journey and you also need encouragement. And so that is the problem we're solving for. We're, pro we're solving for the lack of knowledge, access, and community as it relates to financial education in women. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's talk a little bit more about your, your lived richer community of dream catchers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think a lot of brands will say, well, we're trying to reach women, right? And, you know, to some success, maybe it's a broad category, <laughs> but I really feel like you have a keen, insight into your audience and who you're trying to serve by providing that access mm -hmm. um, and resources to women in neglected communities. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you found this audience? So really they found me. Um, I, when I first started, like so many entrepreneurs, you're like, I help everybody, 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 <laughs> you know? And what helped was that I, I had a Facebook page and one day I stumbled onto my insights and I looked and I said, everybody's not listening. <laughs> According to this, only 1% of men are listening. <laughs> like it was literally 99.999 women and then 1% 1, 1 of men. And I realized, well, Tiffany, you, you're not reaching men, which is okay. You need to pivot and to be intentionally speaking to women, not accidentally so. And then I especially noticed that women of color, because I'm a black woman, were really leading in like, oh my gosh, there's someone who looks like me, who sounds like me, similar background to me, who's actually taking the time 
to talk to me about money in a way that's engaging, in a way that I understand. I always say I'm not a financial guru. I'm your financial girlfriend, you know? Right. And so, right. you know, and so that, that, so that especially, so once I really started to lean in to that audience, so the teacher and me, I always have a rule that um, we don't turn anyone away. So like how, how doctors have like their do no harm kind of like um, um, law, right? So my mine is as a teacher, you don't turn any student away. So if you're a man, if you're not a person of color, we welcome everyone, but I'm specifically funneled into um, women and especially women of color because that is the community that has like really responded and is really looking for someone like me. Okay. And that, I think that's really commendable because I think a lot of people sort of get stuck in this kind of myopic, like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what I want to do. This is my goal. And you were able to say, wait a minute, you know, let's pivot. Let's look here. This is who is interacting the most with my brand. Mm -hmm. So I, kudos to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we touched on dream catchers. You said you have this community of over 1 million Yes. dream catchers worldwide mm -hmm. yes, which worldwide. is staggering <laughs> um so can you tell us a little bit more about how you built this community and really how you actively work to support and engage with them because that's a large audience and i guess you know to me that seems like it would be a really you know big challenge to actively engage with them meaningfully on an ongoing basis how do you do that so one of the things that i learned is that the, the from my teaching um background that the teacher is not the only teacher in the in the in the classroom the classroom is also a teacher right so especially if you're teaching little ones like the letter shapes colors numbers the things that are on the wall those are teachers so i created an environment where they can learn not just directly from me i have a like i have a series of free courses called my live richer challenges and that is their classroom. They can go to liveretrichallenge.com at any time and take one of those free courses. They're anywhere from five weeks long to three weeks long. But also, peers are also teachers. You know, so um, the way we stay engaged is in the beginning, to your point, Liz, I was in the Facebook group like 24 hours a day. I felt like I never slept because I felt like I always had to be there. But then I had to teach them that you can engage with each, within, with each other. Right. Because you might be like, you know, I'm really bad at um, my credit, but I've got three kids and I'm excellent at budgeting. And then this new mom is posting a question about how do I start budgeting? And you're like, oh, my kids are like 15, 16, 17. Like I can help her. So you don't have to wait for me to step in. So I really, it took, a, it took about a year to teach them to look to each other. And then I will come in with additional information, but I am not going to be the sole source of the resources here. So that's another way. And um, also, too, we have a, an email. Um, we email every, every week. I do something called my goodie emails where I find something. It's free. But I find something typically free or really, um, or really low cost to say, hey, here's a resource that I'm really enjoying. I think you'll enjoy it, too. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's great because I think, you know, you really are empowering people to sort of take their financial, you know, whatever they want to do financially upon themselves, not yeah. really relying on you to be this like one voice, which yes. is amazing. So we've talked, you, you know, you keep mentioning the word teacher and I, for people who don't know your story, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? I think, you know, you have such an amazing story that so many people will be able to relate to. Um, to quote you specifically, you said your story is not all pretty. It's not all ugly either, but it's all me and it's all true. Yeah. So I think your honesty and your vulnerability is super inspiring. So tell us about your journey and how you got here. Sure. So I, I grew up in a household where finances were talked about openly and freely. My father was also an alum of, of, of um, Montclair State. Um, <laughs> he had, he got his finance degree from Montclair State and then he went on to get his economics degree, um, his master's degree in, in economics. And he and my mom made it their mission to teach my four sisters and I um, about personal finance in a way that was age appropriate um, in a way that was also engaging. Like I knew how to budget when I was like 10 because I would sit with him and, and budget with him. And so I was, I grew up with that. I didn't think anything of it. I, I went to school. I remember my last year in, at Montclair State, I realized like, oh, I don't know if I want to be, um, I, I was working, um, I had a corporate internship and I said, I don't know if I wanna work in corporate America. And so I decided instead that, um, because on campus at Montclair State, I was working at the childcare center and I loved it. 
And so I pivoted. I was like, I'm going to get this degree because no one's staying longer. You know, but I know after graduating, I'm going to, I think I want to become a teacher. And so I did. And I was doing well until like my mid 20s until I actually um, was, I was a victim of a credit card scam that left me $35,000 in debt. And, um, and then right after that, the recession hit, the 2008, 2009 recession hit, and I lost my teaching job because my school closed. And it was like hit after hit because at 25, I'd bought a house. So now I've got a mortgage. At 26, I got my master's in education. So now I've got student loan debt. I had already, because I commuted to Montclair, I was able to pay off my undergrad student loan debt. So I've got a mortgage, student loan debt, $35,000 in, in the scam credit card debt. And now all of a sudden, no job. Oh. And, you know, and I wasn't the only one. There were so many people struggling during that time. And that's when I really built the Budgetista. Because as, as I was building my own self back up, my friends would ask me for help. And I'm like, well, I'm just trying to figure it out. They're like, but you're doing a better job at figuring it out. <laughs> you know, because I was leaning in on the, what I learned at home. Right. You know? And so the Budgetista started just one-on-one. -on -one. People would come to my house. And then I connected with the United Way um, in Greater Newark. And I wrote curriculum for them started teaching the community and then Prudential heard about it, started working with them and then, and then, and then, and then, and before I knew it, I was like, I guess I have a business. And now 10 years later, you know, we are a collection of different businesses, but we do really well. We help, you know, so many people, especially women uh, worldwide. So it was a, it was really hard at first, but I'm grateful for the hard because I realized that had I not gone through it, how can I teach someone to go through it? You know, right. when right. someone comes to me and they're feeling ashamed about their debt, I'm like, oh, girl, let me tell you about debt. You know, <laughs> or like, you know, they're ashamed about bankruptcy. I'm like, oh, really? Because I just went through foreclosure a few years ago when I, you know, when the recession happened. And they're like, oh, okay. And so I like, so I, I have the path because I've lived the path. And right. I'm able to share it and to show them how they can shed the shame so they can embrace, embrace the resources and, and, and embrace moving forward. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, that talks, you know, you're talking about so much resiliency mm -hmm. and, you know, finding your voice. How, you know, tell us a little bit more about some of the things or the practices or what really you leaned on to help you through this time when you were you know, trying to find your confidence and trying to find your voice and really not lose hope that this was your path and that you were meant to be an entrepreneur. How did you, you know, you talked about, you know, working through it, but what are some other things that you just really relied on to get you through this? Because I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. They hit that roadblock and then it's just like, I don't know what to do. Honestly, I mean, every day, there's days now where I'm like, I give up. I'm going back to teacher, <laughs> teacher preschool. Cause it's hard. So yeah. what I rely heavily on friends and family who believe in you often when you don't believe in yourself. So I used to call it like, call it talking, talking me off the ledge. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm just going to walk off the ledge. I just can't do this. And so my, I would call my best friend and say, girl, I'm on the ledge. I'm going to walk off and just quit and just go back to teaching preschool. This is too much. And she would talk me back like, no, you can do it. We've gone so far. And so I had a, a collection of of friends that I would lean into. Um, and many of them were, 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 were new business owners just like me. Um, but I also, what helped a lot was volunteering. Honestly, I really believe that giving activates abundance. And it, it, sometimes it would be volunteering in relation to teaching the budgetista, like teaching you know, financial education. And sometimes it would just be like, we're feeding the homeless today. Or, you know what, I'm going to see if my sister needs a babysitter today. That oftentimes when I'm really overwhelmed, I tell myself, well, that's because you've been watching the Tiffany channel too, too long. It's me, 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 Tiffany, Tiffany, Tiffany. I gotta, gotta, gotta. So it's like, well, let's break away from that and be of service to someone else. Because oftentimes it puts what you're going through into perspective. Like, is it really that bad? No, girl, because you have a place to sleep. You have food to eat. And the truth is, you know, the solution is coming, but it's just in a week. Okay. And so that helped tremendously. If I would say the biggest thing that helps now and then is, um, is service, is how can I be of service to someone else for no other reason just to be of service to someone else, whether it's someone I know, someone I don't know on the broader sense. And so in doing that, it gets me back on track. Um, it puts things into perspective and puts the joy back in the journey. That's awesome. Very, very commendable. And I, I, you know, I think that it's really worth noting that you are changing people's lives, right? Um, and there has to be so much reward in that, in that service. Um, and I saw 
on your website, you've helped Dreamcatcher save over $200 million. That's insane. That's amazing. <laughs> so, you know, like you just said, service, you know, having that mission, that service is the core, is at the core of what you do and not mm -hmm. some like contrived corporate afterthought, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that's got to be a challenge to keep that service piece yes. kind of front and center while you're trying to run a business day to day. So how do you, how do you do that balancing act and really stay, you know, key on service? And you're right, Liz, it, it is difficult because I think what made it easier for me is because I started with that. So to your point, I didn't have to embed that later. You know, it was it, because honestly, in the I would say for the first two or three years, I did not know how to make any money. And so I was like babysitting and tutoring on the side and running a business that didn't make any money because I didn't charge anyone because I would sit one-on-one -on -one with a single mom and her kids would be running around and we'd look at each other after we did her budget and it says no money left. And I'd be like, this one's on me. <laughs> so that happened over and over and over again because I'm like, how can I take money from someone who doesn't have it? So what it taught me to be though is okay, you want to help people, Tiffany. Yes. You don't want to be an additional financial burden. No. What do I do? What do I do? So it forced me to think outside the box. And I said, okay, is there someone else that can pay me on behalf of the person I want to help? So that was like my first aha, like, you know what? There is. And I asked my mentor, I remember at the time, she was like, see if you can get contracts that these businesses can pay you. And then you can then go out into the community to do good works. And the United Way was the first one I was able to convince to do that. They were like, we already have this program in place. A bank has, has sponsored us and they want us to give this money to the community, but they want them to have education in place before they receive this money. And so do you think you could write a curriculum for us and teach it? And I was like, yes. So it was amazing. At first, the United Way, they were the ones kind of finding people for the classroom. And it was maybe like five or six people. And I said, there's like more chairs and like, it doesn't cost any more. I know the bank is only saying we're going to give money to these five or six people, but they've already paid for the class. Why not fill up? The, even if they're not getting the bank money, they can still get the information for free. Can I share? Because I, 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 would, I would hate for people not to get this information. And the United Way was like, sure. So I put it out there. Hey, free classes. Like, um, you know, the funding from the bank is already used up. But if you just want to take free classes and then the next the next cohort, because it was a it was a five week or six week um, class. So every Tuesday we'd meet the next cohort. I said I put it out there on social media. Hey, teaching these free classes, sign up. We had 20 people instead of five. The next one after that, we had 50 people. The next one after that, 100. The next, it was just amazing. As it grew, people didn't mind that they weren't getting the money from the bank and maybe only a handful qualified for that. They were just like, I'm here every single Tuesday. I would tell parents who had kids, they're like, oh, I have a little one. I'm like, you know, I used to teach preschool, right? Bring her. <laughs> I would have like Miss Tiffany's Corner, like and crayons and things to play with, you know? And then while we did our work over here. And so it just honestly was amazing. I did that for three years. I had, I don't know, maybe like 15, 16 different cohorts. And so that's how I, I, I am able to maintain the, the purpose in with the profit is that I always think people and purpose first. And then I think, how do I monetize the thing that I want to do? I want to serve in this way. Is there a way to monetize? And I have to say, Liz, that mm, I would say that we monetize a good 30 to maybe 40% and the rest, we haven't figured it out yet, but we still do the work. That's, that's what's most important, you know? Yeah. Amazing. Um, so talking about, you know, money and funding, I want to, you know, given your amazing background and, you know, your financial knowledge, I'm really interested in hearing about your funding journey more specifically. Mm -hmm. um, has your business been self-funded from the beginning? Did you have investors? Did you, you know, receive any venture capital? You know, given your financial prowess, you know, I would assume that that was something you really thought about. Like you didn't want to put yourself further in debt. So mm -hmm. how did you think about financing this business from the beginning? Honestly, in the beginning, I didn't even know that I was like, what's a venture capitalist? People give you money, you know? <laughs> so I didn't even consider that somebody would give me money to do anything. So it was self-funded. It would be, literally be like, I made a hundred dollars today. I'm going to put a hundred dollars, um, you know, I'm going to set aside 20 of it for me. And then I'm going to put a hundred dollars back in the business. And sometimes it would be, I made a hundred, I put a hundred back in the business and I tutor and babysit to make real money, you okay. know? 
you know, so because I was like, it wasn't enough. I'm like, the business has to sustain itself and it, it didn't have enough to pay me the first few years. Like, cause I think maybe year one, maybe I made $15,000, not as Tiffany, as the business. Right. Year two, maybe 30,000. So how, what can I pull from that, you know, for myself? Um, and so, yeah, I, I self-sustained by just like, it, it's okay to have these side hustles, to have an actual job, you know, as you're working on your business and allowing your business to like make money, reinvest, make money, reinvest, invest. So I did that. So as, as a result, I was able to build the budget needs to, um, maybe five years in, I think I'd got to like $150,000 a year, just as like budget needs to not Tiffany. And maybe my take home was maybe like 35,000. So not even what I used to make as a school teacher. And then I was like, okay, how do I scale up? And so I started, I, I, I brought on a co-founder, not for the budget, needs to, but for a new project, my online school, the Literature Academy. And he, and if you're ever going to partner with someone, they should bring in an extraordinary skill that you do not have. Right. He is a master marketer. Although I had, I got my, my degree from Montclair State was, um, was uh, I have my business um, degree with my concentration in marketing. So I was good at organic marketing. He was really good at this new digital marketing at the time. You know, it was like kind of like the wild, wild west and new. And so I said, okay, he's really good at this. I'm good at this. And together we launched the online school and he used his marketing prowess. So the online school got money from the bank of budget Nista. So I remember it was like, I remember it cost us about $70,000 to build and everything else we had to do to launch it. And so the budget Nista made 150 that year. So 70,000, the budget Nista kept to run itself and the other money went into the the um the literature academy and it took about a year and a half the literature academy was able to pay the budget needs to back its money and then the literature academy started to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow on its own mm -hmm. um and so same thing with my other businesses i i started um i recently wrote a children's book and like the the book itself there's no money for like the book. It's called um, the character. Uh, the, it's the name of the company, Molly Moore. There's no money for Molly Moore. She hasn't done anything yet. So the budget needs to said, okay, I will loan you money to print the book, get distribution, get the illustrator. And as Molly's making money, it's paying the bank of budget needs to back. So I, I guess I could say that I'm my own venture capitalist, <laughs> you know? And what I love about that though is, is it slower? Absolutely. But, and I'm not opposed to investing um, in your know, investor money, not VC money. Um, but um, I'm not opposed to investor money as long as I can maintain the mission and ownership. I'm not interested in, um, in sharing ownership. Ownership equals wealth. Too many people give away ownership too soon. Um, and I'm not saying, because I mean, like Jeff Bezos may own like, I don't know, 12% of Amazon. And obviously he's this trillionaire. Um, so there is something to be said for trading pieces of ownership for extra, extraordinary talent or skill set that you don't bring to the table. So I'm not opposed to that, but I'm certainly not looking to give away the farm for, for money because if it's just the money I can eventually save to get there. And now my business, um, collectively, my business is, is eight figures a year, mm -hmm. um, just over $10 million a year. And um, we have no debt. Like we pay off our credit card debts every month. We don't have any debt whatsoever. I always say my business is, is debt free like my five-year-old nephew, Roman. And, um, and so am I personally, like, I like, we, I like, I own the house that I live in in a, in a rental property, no debt whatsoever. I own, I have a car. My husband has a car, no debt whatsoever. So, That's amazing. you know, so, because I, I feel like as the budgetista, like I, I literally am a living embodiment of what I teach. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so it's hard that way. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't take, um, help because it was easier because I am a digital business. If I was say, um, I wanted to make say like dolls. You, it's a lot of money to like develop this physical thing, find the distributor, find whoever is going to manufacture it. Get, you likely are going to have to get money, you know, mm -hmm. but for me, because I'm a digital business, my overhead is fairly low. So I was able to grow with the money that I was able to provide for myself. Okay. That's very, very inspirational. So before we end, I, I do want to hear a little bit more about all the different pieces of your brand because you did talk about, you just touched on the Literature Academy, but you know, there are so many ways for people to engage with you as your brand. Um, you, you know, we talked about, briefly touched on the Literature Academy, you have the Literature Challenge with mm -hmm. the workbooks, you have your best-selling book, The One Week Budget, 
Um, you have now a children's book. I didn't mm -hmm. know that. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you also created this and passed a law called the Budget Nista Law. I mean, there are so many things that you're doing that are so amazing. Can you tell us quickly about each one of these different brand extensions? Sure. So the Budget Nista is a central brand. It's basically the business of Tiffany. Books, teaching, speaking, spokesperson work. And so, yes, I have several um, uh, books, the One Week Budget, the Literature Challenges. Each challenge that's free online has a corresponding workbook. Um, and then most recently I did, I wrote a children's book to harken back to my days as a preschool teacher called Happy Birthday, Molly Moore. It's a pre-financial education book for your three to seven year olds. So I'm wow. proud of that. So yeah. that's the central brand. And then branching off from that brand is the Live Richer Academy, online school, over 40,000 students that take lessons that, because the challenges are free. So the academy is the next level. So the challenge is gonna teach you how to budget, how to save, how to get out of debt, fix your credit. The academy is gonna teach you, now that you have the foundation, how to buy property, how to invest. You know, what are stocks? How to start a business, um, how to trade options, how to buy real estate, how to buy your first home. And so that's what the, the, the Literature Academy, and what it is is that it's the collection of experts that help me to go from where I am, from where I was to where I am. Those are the teachers in the Literature Academy. They're amazing. And then from there, I have, yes, and so Molly Moore, and I should have grabbed my book. I'm like, it's around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> my, um, my children's book. Um, so it, that actually is going to be, a, it's a separate company onto itself. And so right now it's a children's book, but I want to create um, a um, video series so kids can learn. I want to create other re physical resources that, that parents can order for their kids. So I've created that as a separate um, business. And I kind of have like a silent business, like my marketing business, but it does our internal marketing for us. Mm -hmm. um, so the Budget Nista is, my, is mine totally. I am, I am the sole owner. The, my academy, I have a business partner, Molly Moore, I'm the sole owner. And the marketing company, I have a, the same business partner. And so, um, yeah, so that's, I mean, there is a lot of moving pieces, but a lot of them live within like the dream catchers and literature challenge that all lives within uh, the Budget Nista. But I mean, I'm not a pole. I mean, I'm someone, I realized that I'm a, I guess you can call me a serial entrepreneur, <laughs> yes. you know, okay. and um, because if a good idea comes up and I'm like, I never thought about that. I'm always telling myself, no more Tiffany. Then I'm like, wait, <laughs> that's a great idea. Why are we not doing that? Let's do it. You know? <laughs> well, that's you amazing know. that you're able to kind of see an opportunity and pivot and change. And, um, you know, did, did you always have this vision of what you wanted this to be or have you really had to change and pivot based on what's worked and where you see traction and growth um, i had no idea really? i was just like if i could just make 500 dollars a month so i could pay for this room that i'm living out of now that i lost my house that was my original goal i just need to make so i don't have to move back home with my parents again and then when i made the 500 a month i was like if i could just make 1500 i could maybe actually pay some of these bills for these people who are calling me every day because i couldn't afford it so literally every goal was like if i could just if i could just and then once i got the breathing room i was able to look up and say hey what is a big goal that you might have and i my children's book was one of them i was like i really want to you know like i i loved reading kids books when i was teaching um and i just think that there's something that's missing in the market okay that's a big goal you know like i would really love to like the literature challenges was one of my big goals i was like Everybody doesn't have the money to get financial assistance. How can I create a thing that's going to help people, you know? And, you know, so in the beginning, it's okay to just say, I just need enough money to feed myself and my family. Right. And, you know, as you get more and more solid and stable, it enables you to dream bigger. But yeah, I had, when I tell you I saw none of this coming, coming I'm just as shocked as everyone else, um, probably more so. Um, I just put one foot in front of the other and, um, and start each day with, uh, with gratefulness and with service in mind. I think that's amazing and really what you have to do, especially during this time of the pandemic. Um, you know, I feel like all of us are having to kind of, you know, pivot and change gears and has there, has the pandemic affected anything that you've had to do and sort of, you know, in terms of changing your direction or completely, you know, shutting something down? Like, I think we're all dealing with that right now. So what has helped you sort of build up that resiliency during this time specifically? Well, I try to, well, the good thing is, well, not the good thing, but for some reason, business has really upticked. And I guess 
people are frightened about their finances more so now than ever. So we've seen the opposite. We've seen a flood in, which is great. So we've created a bunch of free resources to help manage. I remember the week when the market crashed, remember we were all like, and so everyone was so scared. So I reached out to all my friends and I said, now's not the time to charge people for things. They need assistance and help. Can we do a series? We did this eight week, eight, eight day series where I had a different friend teach a specific thing, like how to find a job during a pandemic. What should I do with my retirement account? And we created, so now it's, um, it, the website is uh, the budget needs to crisis classes.com okay. and all of them are there and you take them and they're free. And it, it, I wanted to give people a chance to say, okay, there are resources out here. And so we did that. Um, but I definitely have seen an uptick quite honestly in, in business. And, but what I have seen is that, um, because most of the people who work on my team are women, I venture to say 95% of my team is, are women and now they're home and especially now home with the kids and they were really struggling because we all work digitally anyway before even before the pandemic we were all I'm a very digital company everybody worked wherever they were and so what we did was uh, when I noticed that because I would be talking to someone and they'd be like honestly Tiffany I, I didn't get a chance to get it done I don't even I'm not sure who she used my computer I've got three kids and two computers you know and so we just said you know what for the first three weeks of back to school, we were like no team meetings, no meetings, in the, like no, if you need like a really quick call with somebody on the team, you could certainly be like, hey, via Slack, which is our messaging system, can we jump on a quick five minute call? But I said, I didn't want you to have to be like at two o'clock, at three o'clock, it's like for these three weeks, figure out the system for you and, and the kids. And if you need more time, then we'll push it back again, you know, to give you more time. So that's, that's kind of like the pivot that we've been making is to, really be sensitive internally to the people who, who work for me. I call them my unicorn squad because I tell them they make a um, magic happen every day, the you squad. Um, and then externally <laughs> making sure that we're sensitive to what people are going through by providing resources. Um, because yes, we have our paid things, but during times like now people need assistance and they have less and less money to, to get that assistance. So to making sure that we're creating resources that right. people can get the help they need, even if they don't have the income to do so. Right. And I think I saw on your Instagram that um, a lot of people are stress buying right now, too, which is yeah. obviously a problem because we're all sort of sitting at home <laughs> trying to do something. So I think that offering those services to people for free is amazing. So awesome. So I think that, you know, you talked about earlier um, the business of Tiffany, right? So mm -hmm. you being the brand. And so I would love to talk a little bit more about your pricing model and how you came up with pricing your services. Because I talked to a lot of female entrepreneurs who are service brand, you know, they provide a service versus product, mm -hmm. and they really struggle with pricing because essentially you're putting a value to you and to your time. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's specifically for women, it's, that's a hard thing to do. It so is. how did you come up with your pricing and your pricing strategy and how, what value you were gonna put to you and to your time? Honestly, just like everything, I tumbled into it. I just was like, ooh, this would be nice if I made $100. $100? <laughs> and I remember in the beginning, the first few years, I would put out a number, and if the person agreed to it really quickly, I said, that's too low, in my head. Yeah, yep. I said, and I would tell myself, the next person is going to pay $50 more. And so I remember I, remember I kept doing that, because so, I started mostly with speaking engagements. And then I kept doing that until I got the no. So it was like $50 more, $50 more, $50 more. And then, so I asked a friend of mine, because I didn't know any speakers. So I asked a friend who was a consultant and she's like, eh, it's kind of similar. I typically charge $300. And I was like, okay. So I started off at three and then I got a quick yes. Then the next person got 350, quick yes. And I remember I was hovering at 500 for a while because I would say five and the market basically said, Tiffany, we think you're worth five because if I said 550, I would get a no and a pushback to five for the, like, the next three people. But then as I started to get better and use social media to promote my brand, I was able to break through to five to six to a thousand. To, so, you know, so that's really what it was. It's like, so even now, but also too, I ask questions. I remember the moment that I realized that I was severely undervaluing. It was a woman who worked for one of the largest financial institutions in the world. And um, they asked me to do a five week, um, they were going on tour and they were like, Tiffany, we want you to be like our speaker for this like um, tour. Mm -hmm. um, and just to teach like your financial lessons. And I said, okay. And I remember wanting to ask for, meanwhile, they were flying me out, paying for a hotel, but I remember wanting to ask for $5,000 per stop, but being like, there's no way they're going to give me that. Just, they're not going to give me $5,000 per stop. Um, so I'm just going to say 1500, which was still a lot of money. 
-hmm. So let's do the math, right? So I wanted $5,000 for stock and that's $25,000. But I was like, nah, I'm not going to get that. So I said I asked for $1,500 per stock, $1,500, right? Times five. So $7,500, still way more than I had made, like, you know, in the business in so long and ever. Um, so I was doing one of the tour stops and as usual, cause I'd really practice, like I practice in the shower, I practice walking up and down the stairs. Like I practice my, my speaking. And, um, so I, I, I did a tour stop standing ovation, but that was happening regularly. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, um, uh, uh, one of the women came up to me and she was like, um, Tiffany, that was amazing. I said, thanks. She was like, um, I saw your proposal and I was like, oh my gosh. Cause at the time I was charging maybe like $700. So I told them 15. So I was like, I know they have it. Right. I was like, they found me out. She's going to say, how dare you try to charge us? You know? And she was like, right. yeah, she was like, I saw your proposal. Do you know how much we pay the men that stand up there? And I was like, no, she said, we paid them $10,000. Uh -oh. I said, excuse me. <laughs> she was like, when I saw your proposal, my heart dropped. Uh -huh. And I was like, and I literally said this. I said, no one, no one's going to pay me $10,000. She said, who do you think signs the checks? It yes. was her. And I was like, so it was like such a light bulb moment. Right. And like, literally, I went back to my room. I'm not going to lie. I cried because I could have used the $50,000. <laughs> I was like, you could have made $50,000. Um, and I made $7,500 instead. Can you imagine? I was like, you're, you're going back and forth about 5000 Tiffany. And so yeah. that night I uh, went to my website and I, uh, I updated my price. I used to have my pricing on my website. I updated it. And it took like two and a half years before somebody finally agreed to pay me the 10,000. And now I regularly get $30,000 for a speaking engagement. That's amazing. You know, but it was that push. Right. So, and so it's okay not to know it's okay. Cause by then I was already years in the business. It's okay not to have it all perfect. Um, but being willing to say, I put in the work, I practice, practice, practice. I'm good. I'm going to ask. And if they push back, you know, I'll say, okay, well, what can we do? But yeah, that was the push that I needed. So, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people kind of overthink it and it seems like it's just trial and error and yeah. seeing what the market will bear. Well, yep. And see what, what are other people charging in, in comparable categories and, and getting yourself within that range. Awesome. That is so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so we only have about five more minutes uh, with Tiffany. So I want to make sure everybody, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, but one, you know, another question I had for you is, you know, if you would, because a lot of MSU people who are, were in your shoot, who, you know, you were like, however many years ago, you know, who are MS, at MSU, they're trying to really think about starting their own business. What advice would you give to these aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, you know, the do's and the don'ts, um, maybe even as it relates to financial do's and don'ts. Well, what I would say is start now so you can fail now because you are going to fail. It's okay. Meaning fail, meaning like you're going to try a thing, it's not going to work. You know, try another thing, it's not going to work. Very few people try a thing and it works. It just typically doesn't work that way. Right. But it's in the quote unquote failing that you're like, oh, I should have used that website template instead of this one. Got it. Oh, I should have like, you know, I should have named the company this. So the sooner you can get to the failing, the sooner you can get to winning. Because it's through the failure that you learn the lessons. And I, so many of us are so afraid to fail, but it's good. You, you don't learn anything from easy. So many of the things that I'm doing now are as a result of all of the things that I messed up 10 years ago. And I was like, oh, I learned that lesson because I know that website does not work. I know those colors are not, do not work. I remember a big failure that I did, which I'm glad I learned then, was I got my first speaking engagement that was going to pay me $300 to speak. And I was like, oh, and I went online. I'm not proud of this. I tweeted, yes, just booked my first speaking gig with, it was like a nursing home or something like that. Like such and such a nursing home, name them. And they're paying me doctorates. <laughs> Let's just say I got a phone call like 10 minutes later and an email with a screenshot of my screen. My tweet was like, yeah, we're no longer paying you doctorates. Nothing at all, actually. Um, and so <laughs> And I remember talking to the lady. I was like, I'm so sorry. She's like, I know you're excited. You're a young woman. This is your first. But she's like, Tiffany, you cannot, you cannot do that. But she's like, one, what it made the higher ups think is that like, if she comes here, is she going to tweet about what she sees here? This is a nursing home. This is a medical facility. Mm -hmm. So there are HIPAA laws that we have to keep in place. And I just remember being like devastated and embarrassed. But guess what? 
if that hadn't hadn't, hadn't happened at the three hundred dollar level, what if I what if I never learned that thing and I got my first thirty thousand dollars speaking engagement? And I said, okay, just locked in my first thirty, you know, and they're like, mm, no, you haven't actually. Yeah. So I much rather learn at three hundred than at thirty thousand. And so it's like, and, and I even hate to call it failure, but like the challenges are good because it sets you up for the lessons you're going to need to maintain the success that you seek. So start now, start quickly, you know, um, um, fail now. It's, these things are okay. It's part of the process. I would also say too, is um, in the beginning, focus on what I call direct ROI, direct return on investment. It, like now I can make decisions now that I know I'm not going to see the money back for, for another two or three years, because we have enough to do that. In the beginning, I cannot afford to do that. Meaning like, I might say, you know, we're going to rebuild the website. No. When I first started, it was like, what do I need to do to make money today? Do I need this fancy website? I do not. What I need is photocopies because I'm speaking at the United Way today. And I need these physical things in order for them to pay me today. So I would only invest in things where there's a direct return. If I was a baker, I wouldn't get a bakery. No, I would get eggs, sugar, flour. These are the components I need to make the cake so I can sell the cake so I can make the money. And then slowly but surely, if you do that and you set aside some of the money, then you can get the bakery because you have some runway, you have some time and some, and some space. And so that direct return on investment in the very beginning is critically important. Too many people look like a business, but are not really a business. And the looking like a business has become so expensive, it actually shuts their business down. Exactly. Um, so just getting to the chats, um, somebody has a, a question, you know, and I, I can attest to this. I've had many, you know, thoughts about business and, you know, this is a great idea. But I think people are just scared. Like mm -hmm. they like you said, you know, you don't want to fail. You don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. So what would, what are some of the points? I know you said just get going, but what are some other things that you can do to really overcome that deep fear of failure and that it's not going to work out? You can also too, like, I mean, no one turns down volunteering. I used to volunteer a lot with adjacent businesses just to see, you know what I mean? Because you're right. It is scary. Like, I don't even know how to start. Well, see if such and such businesses they might be hiring, you might be an intern, or you might just volunteer your time and efforts just to see like, oh, that's how you do that. Got it. You know? And so it's okay to be, and it's okay. You're not trying to be fearless. That's impossible. You're, you're trying to work despite the fear. So, and, and if you can learn to manage that fearful emotion and act anyway, then there's nothing that can hold you back. So it's something that I, I really worked hard on practicing and it's still something that I work through. So certainly, yes, look at adjacent businesses, see if you can volunteer your time and efforts and learn from them. Um, while you're also starting to build, build the, the, the minimum viable product. So um, let's say for example, that you're like, you know, I really want to start a doll line, but you know how expensive it is to get a mold and a da, 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 da. So I remember I said like, look for my book, Happy Birthday Molly Moore. I was like, you know, what if I did dolls? But then I was like, oh, I talked to a, a woman who makes dolls and when she told me the whole process, I was like, uh, and this is me now. It seems like a lot. So you know what I did? I found a woman online who crocheted and she was like, I crocheted these beautiful dolls. It's about a hundred bucks a piece. And I said, you know what? What if I can pay the hundred dollars for her to make me one doll that looks like the main character of my book. And then I can share, like, would anybody be interested in buying a doll to go along with the book? And so I didn't make any others. And so when I got orders, then I said, hey, now that I have this money, can you make me five dogs? I got $500. And so do you see how like you can do this like low minimum viable product? So it was, it was $100 out of pocket to see. So worst case scenario, people are like, nobody wants that doll. And then my niece Amelia has another doll to add to her collection. You know, best case scenario, I have, I have shown the marketplace something and they responded and I can collect the money ahead of time because I don't have to, so that way I don't have to worry about the overhead. And now I can start to manufacture. And so if I, if I only sell five, then I'm like, oh, that's probably not worth it. But then you sell 10, then 20, then 30. Then you're like, okay, we yeah. have something here. Yeah. Maybe yeah. now I need to start the next steps to, to manufacturing a doll. That's awesome. And, um, you know, the, someone's asking, what's the one quote that keeps you encouraged and keeps you moving? Do you have like a catchphrase? <laughs> um, there is. I always forget the, um, so this is my favorite book. This is The Alchemist. Yes. Um, by Paolo Coelho. I, I, I encourage everyone to read The Alchemist. And he has this quote, I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, 
um, because it's like it's such a like warriors of light hold on um it's such a and paolo such a powerful book for people who are like dreamers who are wanting to dream right and um warriors of light quote let me just probably type in quote because he said something like we the warriors of the light and and you are a warrior of light someone who is wanting to make the world better we the warriors of the light um must be prepared in these uncertain times so something like to to understand that every the universe and everything is conspiring in your favor meaning that even in the darkness you are the light and know that even these dark hard things are actually working to make you better so like it's easy when you're like yeah i got a promotion okay yes but also too the hey you lost that 300 dollars, tiffany that was a good thing because it taught you not to do that so you don't mess up more later. So you have to understand, like, so that's what I love that quote, because it's like, it reminds me that I am a warrior of light and that um, the good and the quote unquote bad are all adding to the betterment of me and my life. I could not agree with that more. You are such an inspiration. Oh, thank you. Um, so before we let you go, because we're about at time, I just want to, um, you know, Tell us, how can people find you? So what are your digital uh, social channels where people can engage with you, engage, engage with your brand? So I am the Budget Nista everywhere. Thebudgetnista.com, okay. the Budget Nista on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, Facebook. Um, and so if you're looking, if you wanted to get like um, any of my books, they're all available on Amazon, but you can find them on thebudgetnista.com. If you're wanting to sign up for the Live With Your Challenge, um, you can find it at thebudgetnista.com or go to livericherchallenge.com. Same thing with the online school. You can go to livericheracademy.com, but everything is available at the Budget Nista. So I look forward to staying connected. I, my, I would say my favorite um, platform is definitely IG. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yes. Well, we are at time. So thank you everybody for um, joining us and for, you know, participating in the chat. Um, it was so amazing talking with you. You are such an inspiration to MSU students and alum, entrepreneurs, women everywhere. So <laughs> Tiffany Aliche, founder of The Budget Nista and all other things, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your words of wisdom. We really well, thank you. wish you the best. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.